What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Guys, got a show for you today. Today, we got Scott Stallings on the podcast, gracing the airwaves with his journey to the tour to become a three time winner. Now, if you know Scott Stallings, it's probably not only because of his tour accolades, but because of who he is as a person here in our local community. If you're a junior golfer in the state of Tennessee, you know Scott Stallings, especially if you live in the Knoxville area where he started his Kids Play Free program. He has a Scotty tournament. He shows up for the Tennessee Junior Cup matches. So, a very active participant in our junior golf program. He also helps a lot of junior uh, college players as well with their careers and helping them set their trajectories to after college. Now, Scott was very gracious with his time to share his story with us today, and I can't wait for you guys to listen to it. So, without further ado, sit back, relax. If you're going to watch it on YouTube, now is the one to watch it on YouTube. And let's hear the stories and the advice from a three-time tour winner, Scott Stallings. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Junior Golf Blueprint. And today on the show, this man needs no introduction if you live in the state of Tennessee. His name's Scott Stallings, PGA Tour player and a huge junior golf advocate for the players that are trying to come up through the junior ranks right now. And especially if you live in Knoxville, you know his name for the Kids Play Free program that he initiated a few years back. But, Scott, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule as the tour is about to kick off into full steam here in a couple weeks with majors up in front of you. How did you get into the game, though, before we start talking about your illustrious tour career that you've had for the last (laughs) decade-ish? Yeah, that sounds weird. Um, man, I, I I grew up, I played every sport. I uh, played baseball, um, basketball, soccer. Never really a football guy, but, uh, you know, golf was something I always did with my family. Uh, my dad played since I was, a, you know, last, since I, as long as I can remember. And it was something that I always did kind of in between seasons. And uh, as I guess golf progressed and kind of the era of Tiger Woods came along. Um, I guess I wanted to try to get a little bit better and realize that the other sports are kind of getting in the way. And um, it's kind of unique to hear, like tell my story now, especially with the, the era of specialization in youth sports and, you know, seeing kids having to make a decision and sticking with such like, that wasn't necessarily the case with me. It was more just, I decided, Mm-hmm. You know, I knew baseball was kind of getting in the way of golf and, you know, just the, the time and effort it took to play and, and progress w- was just, you know, became very evident very quickly that I was going to have to make some choices. Not that I couldn't try to, to do it all, but, you know, I, I needed to <laughs> decide on my own that if I was going to try to get any better at the game that I really wanted to be the best at, you know, some of the other stuff was going to have to kind of t- take a back seat. Yeah, it, it was it was very rare for like kids in my high school too to be like a four year or a four year letterman in multiple sports, right? I mean, in high school, that's 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 a very difficult ask to be that good at that many sports. Um, and you know, Rob Bell talks about the specialization thing. If it's if it's a passion, like you have a passion for it, it's not really work. It's fun. You know what I mean, and it's and it's just part of the journey. And and like you said, it got in the way with the other other sports got in the way of you wanting to achieve some golfing goals. Um, but you and I are only a few years apart, and I grew up in the same generation as you. It's like Tiger Woods wins that ninety seven Masters, and that was like golf became cool. I want that. <laughs> I want to do that. That looks uh, the fist pumps I me. Mean, nobody was fist pumping before Tiger. You know, really. You know, he made that. He like pretty much. You might as well trademark that for the guy. Um, so. You know, what was you ended up going to Tennessee Tech and, you know, what was like your deciding factors when you were making your college uh, decisions? Obviously, recruitment's not even comparable now from when we were that age. <laughs> yeah. But well, what were some of the deciding factors for you? Well, I mean, I, I kind of I've you know pretty well documented like Tennessee Tech was the last place in the on earth I ever thought I was going to go, nor did I want to go. I put all my hopes and dreams into going to University of Tennessee and I basically made that abundantly clear to all the college coaches as well so like I see college coaches now and they're like you know you know we were interested in you back in like high school was like I never heard from you. he's like yeah we all you basically told everyone you want to go to Tennessee and if it wasn't Tennessee you weren't interested like 
I did that. You are correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I kind of dug my, I kind of dug myself in a hole. And I mean, hindsight's everything. And I mean, I probably would have done things a lot different then. Uh, now that I know what I know, but I mean, tech ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. So my best friends in the world came from there. Um, and I had a college coach that had had some PGA tour experience and kind of knew what it was going to take. And, uh, <sighs> Early in my career uh, at school, uh, I probably didn't take it as serious as I probably should. And we had one fateful uh, Hall of Fame dinner where uh, he told me very clearly in front of a lot of people what he thought, <laughs> uh, good and bad, uh, and awesome. made it uh, very evident that he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And, you know, kind of from that moment on, it was over. Uh, I was going to try to prove him right mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, trying to be what he thought I could be and um I look back on that one meeting while at the time that was the last place <laughs> on earth I ever wanted to be to be basically like publicly shamed <laughs> in, in the midst of the entire athletic department but um I it was probably you know one of the you know career changing moments and honestly it had nothing to do with the golf club in my hand it just had that was a, one of the first times in my life I had a few things throughout my career where someone believed in me more than I believed in myself, but that was the first time that someone made it publicly known and honestly didn't care who saw it or heard it or anyone. It was right. just like, wow, that, you know, that sucked, like super <laughs> embarrassing, uh, everything. But I look back and, you know, this is a more of a junior golf podcast. So yeah, some yeah. of the things he said don't need to be repeated, but, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday and, uh, you know, he's no longer with us, but I think about some of those words that he said. And, you know, even now, this is my 11th year on tour and look back, it's like, man, like I still want to try to continue to prove him right over and over and over and continue to be a good steward of the, of the talent and ability to have and, and try to push the game, not only on tour to continue to try to get better, but try to make the world of golf in the, the place that I have a way to impact better as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny how, you know, everybody has that moment. Right. And that's another Rob Bellism right there. The hinge, like that one thing that has to like kick you into the next gear. And, you know, for me, it was when I got fired from West Haven with Virgil Herring, like with both of us, we got the boot. And that was the first time I had to either make a decision, like, am I going to go out on my own and prove myself as a coach that's worthy of being a coach to all these people and not just Virgil's understudy, you know, and, and sometimes those moments are just kind of forced into your, into your hand and, and you have to kind of discover who you are as you, you know, on your own sometimes too. Right. And, and when you were, you know, finishing up the college career and deciding to go play tour golf, you know, when you had to make that final call and say, I'm going to go do this, this is, this is going to be my career choice you know, what was those deciding factors and, and how, you know, you know, how did that go when you first came out of the gate? Well, I was very fortunate. I had a good group of guys in Knoxville that helped me out. And honestly, man, I had no idea what that was like. But while I was at Tech, your junior and senior year, you got one week at business school. You got a, uh, basically a week off of school to go interview for jobs. And, uh, you know, basically how you got credit for your class your missing class was you had to write a report on the job that you interviewed for. And I was a smart Alec and <laughs> I was like, well, I'm a, I'm a be a pro. Like I don't need to go interview for these jobs. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Not that I have any clue now, but, um, and I <laughs> wrote this paper as far as I don't need to do this. I'm going to play pro golf. Like I don't need to go interview or this. And, same, another one of those like hinge moments, Dr. Tom Timmerman, who is my advisor as well, <laughs> which didn't help, <laughs> which probably helped, but didn't help at the time. He's like, ah, we got an expiring pro athlete in the group. Little did we know, like we were in presence of greatness the whole time. And, <laughs> and we're just sitting there just, you know, trying to get through class. And, uh, Mr. Stallings, could you come to the front and, uh, and, and, like in, give everyone insight into your aspirations and, and why you chose not to do what I asked basically everyone else in the class to do and, and kind of your reasoning behind it. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to make a, a decision to play pro golf when I get out of school. And, uh, you know, I feel like I need to be all in. I don't need to give myself an out and, and which are all kind of the right things to say. And he's like, great. Like, I'm glad you're uh, thinking about this, but 
So when you graduate college and, and you're going to go to your first tournament, how are you going to pay for the gas to get there? And I like, Oh no, (laughs) (laughs) he just got you. (laughs) I mean, just literally cut my legs out from under me in front of our entire (laughs) class. And I felt about this big and, uh, I mean, he, it was all lighthearted and good and well-intentioned, but just the realization of, man, it's like the playing of golf is difficult, but also, it, it, you know, a lot of people get lost in all the intricate details as far as like the who, what, why, when, and how of, mm-hmm. of what you do, you know, when you technically are a professional golfer. And uh, he was, I mean, he needled me as much as you could possibly needle a human in that situation, and well deserved. I deserved every bit of it. Uh, but I think at the at the end of the day, he set me down, and he's like, "All right, when we do these weeks, like I'm going to help you develop a business plan as far as how to turn pro." That's awesome. And I like sweet. So we basically built this business plan as far as how to go from a collegiate golfer to uh, a PGA Tour player in four years. And, you know, kind of the transition period, many tours, you know, at the time is nationwide tour and, Mm -hmm. and try to develop this plan as far as how to get there. And, you know, you basically like starting a business, like how much money you got to raise, where you're going to play operating expenses and kind of situations for basically every kind of contingency you can imagine. And the number one mistake I get when a bunch of people reach out to me is, as uh, like I'm going to go play pro golf and I'm going to ask for, you know, 25,000. Like, all right. So your, your plan is based off of you playing well. He's like, well, yeah, I go out there, get a little bit of money and, 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 you know, start making a little bit and then I can kind of sustain myself. Well, in, from a financial decision, as far as having ownership of your success out there is great, but anyone that's gone out there and done it, like find it, playing professional golf is hard enough on its own, like right. financial pressure on the backside of it is, no bueno. is ma- making it <laughs> harder than it needs to be. So like we basically made my plan off of utter failure <laughs> and uh, um, just making sure that like, I didn't have to like all the questions were answered. I know that not everyone has that same opportunity, but I was incredibly fortunate enough to, first of all, have him take the time and effort to help me develop that, but also to be able to sit down with some people in Knoxville where I grew up and kind of help push me in the right direction and and build a good base to be able to go out there and play, not stress-free, but to know that like I was going to able to give it like a fair shake to go out there and kind of see what it was like and kind of build up from there. Right. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of like announcers talk about how much a putt was worth, like the Nate Lashley thing at Pebble. They talk about like, you know, missing those putts coming down the stretch, whatever. And I really, everybody I've talked to that has success out tour, the, the, the check doesn't, isn't what they're out there for. I mean, they're out there for the win. They, they're, they're out there because they want to compete and the check's just part of it. Right. And now, and, and, uh, uh I mean, I have definitely thought about that after the fact, or, hey, I made birdie and that was this, or you make a bogey and you think about that, but you take into account, man, I hit 260, 70 shots a week. I mean, yeah. it's hard to, but you know, you got to go with the pressure. I totally understand what you're saying, but in, yeah. in 14 years as a pro, like I'm definitely like, oh man, <laughs> like <laughs> the, the ones that kind of keep you awake for a minute, but, but you're exactly right. Like I'm not out there thinking, Oh well, if I just if I don't go for it, you know, maybe that's worth this, or if I go for it, then it's kind of worth that. Like, you don't necessarily. I mean, that's gambling, uh, <laughs> not necessarily like, hey, just you know, putting yourself in that situation and trying to be in the hunt coming down the stretch on the back down on Sunday, and I mean, there's no other feeling like it in the world. And I mean, yeah. as a professional golfer, that's what we strive for. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting that you know your your uh, administrator administrator helps you with that plan, and it. it you know, you went, you turned pro in about in 08, correct? And then you, mm-hmm. and then you took off and then had a couple years running the minis and then went on to your PJ tour status in 2011, 2010, you know, so you had a couple years playing around those, the smaller circuits before you got the, you punched the ticket to a full-time status. What was, you know, what was that journey like in, in trying to get your full-time card? It's a lot different than now. I mean, at, when I came out, it was kind of like the heyday of like the mini tours. I mean, Ted Potter made like, you know, over 300000 on the Hooters tour. Uh, there was guys making over $200,000 on the e-golf and Tar Heel tour. And then Gateway was doing great. And Florida had a winter series. And it was just, 
as far as financially, there was significantly more opportunities than there are now as far as guys chasing Mondays and, and trying to build some kind of status because, you know, there was the, the business of mini tour, if you want to take a look mm-hmm. at it. And that's changed a lot. I remember doing my first, like, interview with some junior golfers and, and guys going from college to, to professional and them asking me that same question, what was it like? It's like, well, I never won – uh, on the mini tour and you know i was able to you know make a, a decent living as far as to pay back investors and this and i never won and they're like well what does that look like i mean the winning check on the hooters tour is 35 grand like mm-hmm. if you told a mini tour player that now they'd be like in what world is that <laughs> like uh, the, especially the now tar- in latin america <laughs> yeah the, the tar hill tour had or the e-golf tour at the time had four events where uh first place was 50 grand Holy and cow. like you, you just hear that kind of stuff. And as a, you know, what professional golf looks like now, and it's just a lot different landscape. So there was a lot of opportunities to play. Uh, I tell everyone like chasing Mondays, trying to aspire status and everything is great and a very uh, admirable goal. But at the end of the day, like you play professional golf and tournament golf and putting yourself in that situation, teeing it up, writing your name at, on the card at the end you know, playing for a check, playing for opportunity to win tournaments is, you know, how you kind of, you know, check yourself and figure out things you need to get better, learning how to deal with pressure, learning how to manage a schedule and, and kind of learning that and, you know, playing one round of tournament golf, you know, why it has its, or, you know, qualifying golf to try to get in, you know, has its place in everyone's schedule. Like it can't end all be all just because at the end of the day, I think you got to put yourself in there and, and know how to play four days and know how to kind of manage the, everything that goes with, you know, playing a 72 hole event. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's kind of like what we tell kids as they're coming up through the junior ranks, right? You know, you win a nine hole event cause you're like nine, 10 years old. And then you got to learn how to win an 18 hole event. You got to learn how to win a 36 hole event and a 54 hole event for the state junior AM. And you just kind of progressively learn how to, you know, not just win because you had lights out for 18 holes, but you got to have lights out for, 72 holes to win a pj tournament mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't just kind of mm-hmm. have casually get it done and especially in this day and age it feels like that thursday friday round is is huge obviously for making the cut but i mean you, you just need like one solid round and then you know kind of like kind of breathe a little bit and then make your cut and go on and play your weekend and make your check and it, i can imagine that's definitely playing a lot of emotional cards when you're young and, and you're trying to you know keep your card mm-hmm yeah, the, I mean, kind of the tournament is, you know, for the most part, you kind of take 54, which is going to kind of be just – it is what it is, some bogeys, some birdies, and just kind of managing it. And, like, how hot is your hot nine and how bad is your bad nine? And then kind of modulate the rest of it. Like and, that. you know, un- understanding that, you know, when it comes, it, it's going to come in waves. But also, you know, that bad lie in the rough and, you know, the – you know, the sketchy up and down, whatever, understanding the value of just the number of shots and the number of holes that you're going to have to play. Like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And understanding that when you do have the opportunity to put your foot on the gas, like, you're not going to shy away from it. And But also, you you have the discipline enough to kind of pull it back and when it's not a a perfect scenario or whatever and kind of put yourself in that spot and, and be able to assess risk uh i do a bunch with college golfers and and understanding like why did you put yourself in that situation well i thought this like well you thought that but like did you commit to it did you and then next thing you know like they they take something on and it doesn't work out and immediately it's everyone else's fault but their own i said man you assume the risk when you made that decision so you need to when you assume that risk you take full responsibility for whatever outcome that is Mm -hmm. that's how you see a bunch of guys that like they go for, uh, you know, uh, whatever. They, they're they going for a par five and two. You know, they hit it in the hazard or whatever, and then they go up there and wedge it up to a foot and make par. And it's like, how did you do that? It's like, man, I knew that, you know, if I didn't pull the shot off, that's what I was going to have to do. Like, mm-hmm. I just assumed that this is the risk I'm willing to take, and, and if it doesn't work out, I'm just going to deal with the consequences. And the people that do that better than others, I mean, are the people that are super resilient and nothing really ever phases them. Oh, totally. And totally. – so I see that a lot. Yeah, and that's kind of like where the the stats world starting to take shape and all this stuff with strokes gain, and and that's been a very big, you know, 
I think help for everybody trying to really, really understanding, you know, yes, you can gain shots on the field with hitting your driver farther than everybody else. You know, you can, you know, gain shots on the field by draining a few more 20 footers than everybody else. Right. And um, when, when you, you know, snagged your first tour win, you know, at the, at the Greenbrier and, 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 and did it in a cool fashion too, right? I mean, that was kind of a unique case scenario going to a playoff, lighting up. You talk about your your hot round and your cold round. You might have had both in the last round. <laughs> I, I did, 100%. 30, 39 30 with the bogey. <laughs> so, what was, uh, you know, what was the, what was that emotion like? I mean, obviously, you come off the front, you got to be a little pissed, and then you got to like turn on the jets and then you just put it to work. Well, going into the final round, I was number one off the tee by like, a bunch <laughs> like, <laughs> and I only think on the front nine on Sunday I had, I had only hit one fairway and wow. I shot four over and number 10 and it a green bar you know we don't who knows if we're gonna play that tournament ever again or whatever but the 10th hole and when I won it was in August so mm. it the ball was going forever mm. like so far because there's a little bit of elevation it was super warm like so number 10 was like a, like a long iron and like a, you know, sand wedge or gap wedge or something. Mm -hmm. So we go to number 10 and my caddy's like, man, I promise you can hit this fairway. Like I promise. And I like one hopped it in the left rough and it bounced out in the fairway. I'm like, Oh my gosh, here we go. Like I finally <laughs> hit, I finally hit a fairway and I hit a, you know, a gap wedge into, you know, 10 feet and I made it. And they're like, mm -hmm. okay. And then it was like, all right, man, maybe if we play halfway decent on the back, we can come close to finishing the top 10 because who knows what place I was in at the time. Right. And then I, I birdied 11, then I birdied 12, and I birdied 14, I birdied 16. And then I then like building up the anticipation, not that I was thinking about winning the tournament, but we go to 17 and I've just made these birdies and I'm like ready to drive the green. And there's three groups on the tee waiting, par five. I drive at the water, make bogey. End up looking up, was like, oh, I stopped for the lead. Whoa. But just situational awareness, first time really being in that environment and kind of the, you know, two hours ago, I was just trying to finish in the top 10. Then next thing you know, I reel off a few birdies and, you know, everything kind of changes. And right. uh, obviously, there's a crazy amount of emotion that, that goes into it and, you know, kind of managing, you know, kind of all that throughout. And, and honestly, it happened so fast, I didn't really have time to think in the playoff. Um, I made birdie in regulation to get into a playoff and then basically got to go back 15 minutes later and hit the, sorry. No, you're good. Uh, you're good. Uh, Darren, Darren Reese is calling me <laughs> so you can give him <laughs> you a hard tell time. Him, you, I'm, I'm going to text him right after this and give him a rough time. So go back. Yeah. yeah um, but I, uh, you know, I basically had 15 minutes and no warm up or anything. Just went back. It's like, oh, it's the same shot. I just did this, and I'm almost like they were like three inches apart. Wow! <laughs> and uh, we you know, was able to make the putt, and you know, kind of the rest was history after that. And um, you know, I told Bill Haas I was single handedly responsible for him winning the FedEx Cup. <laughs> I said lo losing to me would just fired him up and got him in position to win the FedEx Cup. So that's, that's right. I beat him in a playoff. He won the FedEx Cup. Probably worked out a little better for him, but it worked out good for me too. So yeah, that's right. I say the FedEx Cup has a good paycheck at the end of the day. But um, yeah, you know, it, and it's interesting too because you, you know you hear stories about how once you start getting some notoriety on the tour, you know, you, you gain a few wins, like you were a three time winner pretty quick and you start becoming a known face that your schedule has to start to change to adapt to being a little more recognizable. You might have to sign more autographs or more publicity stuff and, and contracts and stuff like that. So, you know, as you, as your career has evolved, how has your schedule had to evolve so that you can stay on top of your game? I mean, honestly, just being resilient and understanding that, you know, you, you try to have as much information as you possibly can and understand that, not to the point of like, you know, the stuff that, and not that I'm comparing myself to Michael Phelps in any way, shape or form. He's, a, <laughs> you know, one of the best of all time in the world of, of athletes. And, but just the way that Bob Bowman trained him and just prepare as best you possibly can, but ultimately understand that things are going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's that crazy story where like he booked him all these like travel info. And while Michael was on the way to the airport, he called and he canceled every one of them. <laughs> like just to see him like just deal with like 
adversity and, you know, scheduling changes and, and understanding like what tournaments you're going to play. And, you know, I, I mean, this is my 11th year and my schedule still has variables in it. You know, yep. you know, if you have to, you have to do this. And if you don't, you kind of do that. And, you know, we all know that one good week changes everything. And, totally. you know, then you kind of adjust from there. And, um, but try to stay on top of my game as best I possibly can and also learn how to get away from it as well. And I didn't do a very good job of that early in my career. I kind of only knew how to just be at the golf course all day, every day. And while there is a lot of that that still takes place, you know, having a family and young kids and, you know, you don't want to say a blessed distraction, but it truly is and kind of a way to kind of, you know, it, it, I could have the best week I've had in a long time and come back and, I've got a almost five year old little girl who could completely care less about golf, but she knows that like dad's home and it's time to do this or my son's ready to go out in the yard and do something or my honey do list for my wife is, you know, biblically long. And next thing you know, it's like, guys, you know, dead fish top five last week. They're like, uh, you good job. <laughs> but the same side of it, you know, you have a couple of missed cuts and you're frustrated and this and that. And, you know, it's kind of a welcome distraction to go back into that where it's not just like, why are you missing cuts? And, you know, why can't you make a putt inside of five feet? And, you know, all these different things that kind of go in with struggling. And right. so there, there's positive and negatives to both. And, you know, kind of seeing uh, just managing. And obviously, I, I feel like I'm smarter now than I was when I was early in my career, maybe or maybe not. But <laughs> Well, I guess uh, it's a little disappointing you don't hear that the, it knocks off the honeydew list. So I don't get to lean on that one, I guess, if I ever do something great. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, and my, if my wife ever watches this, uh, I, I love you and I appreciate the <laughs> honey do list, but, uh, I just, I think it's funny when I come home, she's like, Oh, there's a list when you get home and it's all like nothing. Like she doesn't really trust me to do a lot. <laughs> not, not that I'm some like magical handyman, but I'm pretty good taking the trash out. And, you know, kind of, we kind of moved out in the woods, uh, a few nice. years ago here in Knoxville. And awesome. so there's some stuff that goes around with it, but I can hold my own for the most part, but anything that involves a, a significant amount of uh, handiness, uh, we're going to delegate that pretty quick. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Um, so I hear a lot of like, you know, the my college players, when, when they get to interact with, you know, guys like you in, that play on tour, the, the, the ability to hit certain shots, right? Like there's like a whole nother level of shot making that's required when you get to the PJ tour, the creative juices have to flow and, and, and kind of like an understanding how you plot your way around the golf course, right? It has that a level of detail. What was something that when you showed up to the tour, like you had to, you had to learn in order out to, whether it's a shot you had to hit or a way to play the golf course or find the way that made the golf course suit your game. What, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, the value of par, understanding, like, not to put yourself in a spot, like, or, like, when you do get in that spot, understanding how to just, you know, maximize outcomes and and get yourself in a spot where you can't make double bogey and, you know, go from there. And, you know, we're all human and we make bogeys and make bonehead mistakes here and there, but uh, understanding how to, you know, let it ride off and go out there and execute the very next shot and the very next swing and, you know, kind of be able to deal with it as it comes. And uh, I, I wish I could uh, pitch and kind of manage my way around the green early in my career like I do now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of made that a pretty big focus the last few years and um, just different things and, you know, kind of picking the brain as far as different people that you think are truly the best in the world at what they do and, and you know, just trying to learn and um, – you know, I don't think there's necessarily like certain shots where like, oh, I have to learn how to do this or I have to learn how to do that. I think, you know, you kind of remember the first time I hit balls on the range with Tiger was at Torrey and I almost missed my tee time. <laughs> <laughs> like I had, we were sitting there and my caddy was like, man, we tee off in like 15 minutes. You hadn't hit a shot yet. Like oh, I was just like <laughs> just watching Tiger hit and yeah, you kind of get caught up in it. I mean, everyone does that, you know, when you're early in your career, as far as just the realization of like, man, that's the guy that got me to want to do this for a living. And, you know, you kind of take it all in when you're out there actually competing in the same event as him, you know, ha you know, kind of speaks to itself as far as I, the aha made it. But um, I, I think you, you see parts of your game that you can always improve upon. And I mean, I'm working now, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was with my coach for the last couple of days in Georgia and uh, 
working on just kind of piecing a little bit part of my takeaway, my backswing. All of it. And I mean, none of that's like sexy to work on or fun. Or, I mean, I did a speed drill on Wednesday with the stats guy I started working with and I mean, it took me forever and literally <laughs> working on just dying speed of putts, you know, around, you know, 20 feet. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of a make percentage and that I need to get better at from, you know, probably eight to 15 to 20 feet. I need to probably improve upon a lot. And none of that stuff's like life altering, mind blowing things. It's just stuff that just, Hey man, I got to get a little bit better at these things. And you know, that's going to pay dividends in the long run, but it's not like super fun to do or super fun to watch. Right. Uh, and like, Oh man, what'd you do? I did speed drills today. It's like, <laughs> Oh, like, <laughs> Oh <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And, when I was at Legends, it was, it was always fun for me because, you know, the Vanderbilt teams are there, men's and women's team. And then also Brant and Ben Crane would come out and practice a lot. And so those two guys were very gracious and just letting me be like a, you know, fly on the wall and just watch them practice, watch them hit shots. I watched Ben get a lesson from Joe Mayo, you know, and so that was like really kind of cool watching those two guys do some short game stuff, right? And and it's always interesting to me, like the when you, like just how you're talking about how it's not sexy. It's just kind of like it is what it is. This is what I have to get done. And, you know, I think especially junior golfers and kids, you know, they, at the end of the day, they just want to pound driver sometimes, you know what I mean? Just because it's fun. But at the same time, like you have to be able to do those things that are laborious, you know, if you really want to improve. And, and it's, you know, part of the sacrifice that comes to being better or the best um, if you want, if that's your goal. And, you know, obviously your, your tour career has led you to have these opportunities to give back to the junior golf community with, the, the kids play free that you started in Knoxville. Um, what, you know, what started that whole process for you to get involved with the AJGA, get involved with the Knoxville community with junior golf? You know, what was your catalyst for that? I wanted to provide opportunities for the area that, you know, Knoxville was very supportive. I grew up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and everyone in the East Tennessee area was incredibly supportive of me as I started to play golf for a living. And, you know, whether it was golf courses or, you know, financially or just, you know, moral support or whatever, like everywhere I, I felt like people had my back. And when it came around to it, I lived in, uh, while my son was young, we lived in Arizona kind of half the year and Tennessee half the year. And when I knew when we were going to move back, I was like, man, we're going to make we're going to provide opportunities that we didn't have when I was growing up in, in order to try to make golf accessible across all spans, whether it's beginner, junior, elite, whatever, like we were going to try to impact it all. And uh, that was trying to, the, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, you know, got some incredible partners at the golf foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, AJGA was very gracious to let me be a part of their event for almost nine years. And, you know, that kind of transition into the Scotty where we have the team match play now. And, you know, there wasn't necessarily like a hard feelings conversation with AJ. It was just more providing, you know, that, that same continuity as far as how we run events and do things in the state of Tennessee. And um, between junior golf with Rob and the golf foundation with Witt and all his team and basically my right hand man here in Knoxville, Hayden, uh, who I'm pretty sure every time his phone rings and it sees it for me, he's dreading it because there's no <laughs> telling what I'm going to ask him to do. <laughs> uh, but um, we got an incredible uh, opportunity for golf in the state of Tennessee and especially in Knoxville. And golf's giving me more than I ever deserve. And I want to be a good steward of that and uh, have an opportunity to have people learn from from the game and, you know, whether it's pro- at a professional level at a college level or just the fact that, you know, hey, I went out there and, I played an incredibly infuriating game and, uh, but I can't wait to go do it again. <laughs> and just that, you know, that mentality as far as going about it. And I mean, that was kind of the, the idea behind it. And, you know, we've had an incredible run and um, it's been super exciting to see the opportunities we have coming forward. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and it, it was, it was interesting. Like, you know, we, we, we chatted a little bit yesterday and, and you, you made a couple of mentions about, when you were with the AGA, how you would, you would have a parent meeting and a, and a kid meeting. Right. And, and, you know, I, I think that was important because I think there's, there's, those are two different conversations where they have to be separated sometimes. And, and sometimes we get something from a kid that they may not want to say in front of their parent and vice versa. When, when you were with the AGA doing those events and you had those meetings, like what were, 
what were some of the tokens that you were trying to share with those parents and, and with the kids that you would share with us today on the show? I mean, honestly, golf's meant to be fun. Uh, there's a time and a place to grind and be serious. But at the end of the day, we all started this to, because it was a game. And that's truly the mentality behind it. And the more that we can treat it that way, the better off we're all going to be. And, you know, I'm a parent. Uh, I've got two kids. I want nothing but the absolute best for my kids and will do anything I, I possibly can to help them. But uh, I told you about the paying chair and the talking chair yesterday. I, I was bringing uh, that up I, later. I, I, okay. Uh, that's a funny story from my coach, Scott Hamilton, which is hilarious, but uh, we can, I can tell that later, but. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Tell it. You need to, you need to tell it. <laughs> okay. All right. So my, my coach, uh, Scott Hamilton is, uh, he's a big redneck from Georgia and he's a great dude. And he was giving a lesson to this dad, uh, this, this dad and this kid were in there and um, the dad just had an opinion on basically everything that Scott said. And so he gets the dad out of the front of his bay and, you know, he's like, you see my chair over there, like with the computer and kind of the screen. And he said, you know, that's the talking chair. And he said, you see that chair over there where like you're sitting, you know, kind of over there watching your son hit. And he's like, that's the paying chair. He said, the paying chair does not interact with the talking chair. And, you know, the, while the talking chair can't move, the paying chair can move. I can put that <laughs> paying chair out here. And then we don't have any more issues from the paying chair. And just the, the fact of parents want it so bad and they want nothing more than their kid to be just the most successful they can, whether it's golf or whatever. I mean, every, every parent wants their for their, for their kid. And I don't think I necessarily understood that as much until I had kids of my own, but just seeing the different thing, you know, you know, kids want their parents not to put so much pressure on them. the parents want their kids to try a little harder, be a little bit more, uh, understanding of the sacrifices that parents make so it's always a constant balance and trying to be a uh not that i was trying to play devil's advocate with both sides but i was trying to maybe have a little bit better ideas from a parent's perspective as far as maybe this is what your kid's thinking but i could probably say a little bit easier than the kid can and then the from the kid's side i could probably answer a little more question well have you thought about the sacrifice that your parents made to get you here mm -hmm. and you know while I was able to kind of answer some questions that may or may not want to be said in front of the other party, I think it was good to separate and then kind of hear me play on both sides. It's not that I have every answer to everything because that's clearly not the case. <laughs> I ask questions every single day to people that are better than me, but it was, I think it was just a, a cool way to do it. And, and most of all the tournaments that I do now, I try to make that available and uh, it's pretty cool to, I think some of it kind of keeps me on my toes and makes me a little bit more available. Like, man, I probably need to get a little bit better at this in my own game right. as far as be cognizant of that. But I think the the joy and the, the love for the game is constantly seen in, in all the stuff that I do. And uh, while it's the most frustrating and infuriating game in the world, it's also the best game in the world because uh, yeah. you can never be too good at You can always improve. And uh, it can teach you lessons both you know, in life and on the golf course. And that's something I try to continue to in every opportunity I have when I do the stuff with the kids. Yeah. And, and, and again, we, we chatted a little yesterday. You made a great point yesterday too, where you said at 14, 15, 16 years old, this game needs to be fun. It, it shouldn't feel like a job when you're in high school. And regardless of whether you're ranked 15th in the world as a junior or whether you're ranked 150th or 1500 in the world, right? It should still be fun. And I, you know, and I want you to kind of express on that point just a little bit more, because obviously you've, you've touched all of it. I mean, you've won on tour and you were a junior golfer and, you know, and you can talk to that journey of where it turns into a job because it is your job. <laughs> right. And so, you know, when you tell kids that are listening, like, you know, how would you help remind them that it needs to be fun? I, I think the, I mean, I, I, there are times where I feel like I'm having that conversation with tour players as well. Like no one went and, and got you out of bed and made you be a tour player. You got yourself here. So like, I know people that would, you know, cut their arm off and, and go out there and try it one handed, just a fact to try to go play on tour. So understanding of the opportunity that you have in the situation that you're in and kind of being a little bit way to kind of take a step back and kind of taking the full perspective in, um, I feel like I had that conversation a lot with college golfers, especially when they're struggling. That's like the woe is me and, you know, things are for this. And then you kind of look, it's, it's like, man, they're not as bad as they, they seem. And like, you know, 
like any person that's trying to make a change or anything, they make this like daunting, like impossible, grandiose. Well, I'm going to do this. and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Well, I mean, all golfers are the same. Like I'm going to be the best driver, best putter, best iron player, best wedger of all time. And next thing you know, like the moment you have one ounce of stroke, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a failure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more that you can continually remind yourself of constant improvement and, a, you know, have a good person to kind of be an outside influence to help you evaluate that is going to help, you know, kind of, you know, keep you in the lane. You know, I, right. I've got people like that in the golf world and I've got a guy that knows nothing about golf that just kind of asks questions to me like, hey, how are you doing about this? And what's the road like and how's your family and, and this and a little bit more to kind of level head. I mean, he can care less about one 10 tournaments in a row or miss 10 cuts in a row. <laughs> He's more concerned about just kind of how I handle myself kind of on a day-to-day basis and, you know, kind of modulate the highs and the lows and kind of, you know, a little bit better perspective as far as just on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, cause like, I mean, I was one of those kids. It was like, I want to play on TV. Right. And, and there, to, in order to reach that level, there has to be sacrifice and, and you have to enjoy the journey because ultimately, and, and you can speak to it too, whether you win on tour or don't win on tour, like after the win, you got to go back to work. Like the work doesn't stop once you get the win. Right. That's, mm-hmm. and, and I was reading something about Tiger, you know, they talk about how he didn't really celebrate after the win. Right. Or something like that. And, you know, it's just part of the process. And I think too many kids live for, that like cherry on top moment. That's like, as soon as you eat the cherry off the ice cream, it, you know, it's gone, man. You know what I mean, and it's like, you missed all the other stuff that's part of it. And so, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was you, you might be known as the man at, at getting it done in the gym right now. Like you are, you're a beast. And like I said, like I told you yesterday, every kid I know that's worked out with you has like, can't move their limbs the next day, apparently. And, uh, <laughs> I almost got you. And so, you know, but you, know, you you had a catalyst that kind of forced your hand into that. Right. And, and, and there was a condition you had to like overcome that, that helped you enjoy not just golf, but your family's life. Right. And, and be a dad and be a husband, you know, so what was that journey to, to, you know, ultimately change your lifestyle so that you can enjoy not just golf, but all parts. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it came down to just me not being a very good steward of what I had, you know, kind of taking a lot for granted. And and I could do what I want when I wanted without really much repercussion on, on either side. As long as I played good golf, everything else got took care of itself. And, you know, you know, people may not realize it, but us golfers were endurance athletes. Um, I say that very lighthearted, but I mean, <laughs> our seasons are long, our days are long. They're super repetitive. And uh, one of the nicest things any trainer has ever said is like, oh, you're an endurance guy. It's like, yes, I am. (laughs) And I just laugh. But, I mean, you start to think about it the way that an endurance person trains is, I mean, they just do it for a really long time, the same thing. And, you know, that's kind of what we do. And uh, I was just kind of a ticking time bomb. And I started trying to make some changes and kind of push myself in the right direction. And just things were not clicking. And, you know, continued to kind of fight a struggle and didn't feel great and uh, started asking some questions and, you know, kind of pulling myself in the right direction. And ultimately it came down to me mm. and, you know, ignorance is not an excuse, but that's a hundred percent what it was. I was kind of, I was scared of information. I was scared of the doctor. I was scared of all these different things that ultimately were, were put in place to help me make better decisions and help me be understanding of what worked for me and what didn't and kind of being able to tell the difference between the two and, instead of just kind of putting my head in the ground and hoping for the best, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, we're all capable of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, I know the guy that like, doesn't like his swing on videos. Like I, I just, I can't see how bad it is. Like, like, well, the only way you're going to know how to get it better <laughs> is to see it. Like, right. Right. And the, the same thing, like, you know, I, I was able to find a bunch of people point me in the right direction and kind of push me. And, and the, like I told you yesterday, when we chatted on the phone, like, most of my changes were ne- had zero to do with golf. Like I didn't, I didn't make the physical and mental changes to be better. If golf happened, that was a huge bonus. But the fact of that, I wanted to be the husband and the father that my kids and my wife deserved more than just a person that's just trying to make it through the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. Um, so, I mean, honestly, 
all that stuff to, to say, you know, now able to play now on tour and feel great and kind of be able to tell more stories and, and show, hopefully we'll push people in the same direction that I did and, and not make the same mistakes that, that I made along the way. And if I could be a go between that, then great. And I'll continue to, to, to push and, and do things like that. But, but ultimately it came down to just a, a lack of discipline and uh, not very well-structured uh, life, both on and off the golf course. Not that I was some like wild hellion by any means, but <laughs> I just kind of like, man, as long as I make birdies and play pretty good, I can kind of do whatever. And right. unfortunately there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of wear and tear that goes into that, that you build it up and you don't take care of it. Like it's not going to take very long to fall apart. Right. Well, and, and you, you, you had a quote on, on your Instagram, you know, where you talked about, um, you got to make one decision to get better every day. Right. And that's kind of how it all started. And, and I think, I mean, you need to like hashtag that or something, make a shirt. I mean, something that, you know, I, I think it, 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 Rob Bell talks about that too. And, and the guy that I use, that's one of his associates, you know, if you do 1% better every day, it adds up over the course of a year. I mean, it pays mm-hmm. off and, and you may not see the dividend that today, tomorrow, next week or next month, but if you keep doing it, by the time you put a year, two years, five years, whatever behind it, it shows up in the end, right? And I think that's, you know, something that a lot of kids, I think, need to hear is that, and, and you made a mention about it before, is like, you want to be the best short game player in the world. And then you have one bad chipping day and it's like, oh, woe is me. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, okay, so you have one hiccup in the, in, the, in the climb up the mountain, right? It's not a straight climb. There's always a couple dips along the way. And... So I, I know you, know you let some kids come out and, and shadow you for a day and, and do that kind of process, you know, so what, you know, when you, when you show like a couple of kids that are prospecting in the college, you know, what your day is like, what's kind of like the, what's, <laughs> what's kind of the response? Um, well, like I told you, I, one of my coach was working with a, a, a young girl and, uh, most of the time, like, I don't really hit a lot of balls. So when I practice with him, I'll go practice, like, hit some, chip some, putt some, and I'll go play, like, a two-hole loop, a four-hole loop or whatever. And just so happened that one of the days I was going to go out and just play nine and kind of play this little game within myself. And he said, man, you mind just kind of, you know, having her follow you along and and just kind of see, you know, what you do. And so we get done, and, I, you know, we talk the whole time while we were out there playing and, um, she's asking questions and this and that. And, uh, I, I made birdie on the last hole and, and she's like, you know, you made five birdies and nine holes is like, yeah. And she's like, that's great. I was like, well, I didn't come out. My score was not even remotely. She's like, well, well what were you thinking about? It's like, well, wh- how, what do you take from this nine holes? Like, well, I'm sitting there thinking about of the course of the nine holes, like what hole, what shots did I go through the process correctly and poorly execute? And there was the the fifteenth hole, and at his course is kind of a straightaway par four, is a back left pin, and I like to see the ball fall left to right. So you know, kind of moving my target a little bit more on those left pins, especially off off speeders, is something that I don't really do. I'm not the best at, mm-hmm. and I kind of you know hit my miss. I kind of thin right, you know, kind of you know, 30 feet right of the pin and, you know, it's a pitching wedge and like, come on, man, I got to get better at that. So she's like, man, you didn't think about the fact that you made five birdies. Like, no, like, that's <laughs> like, if I feel like I'm doing pretty good, that's kind of what I probably should do. Mm-hmm. But I'm sitting there thinking about the fact of not that I'm breaking my whole nine hole round into one shot, but like, all right, that's something that kind of sticks out mm-hmm. that different things. So I kind of use on the course to evaluate how I go practice. I don't just sit there and hit a bunch of seven hours, see how good I can hit them. (laughs) You know, you start stringing them together pretty good. It's probably time to go do something else. But I think people try to make practice and prep a little bit harder than it needs to be. Um, And the idea of being able to step away and all right, when it, when it's good enough, it's good enough. And, you know, that kind of, you know, all right, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about my game. Let's, you know, try to go figure out something else to do here instead of like, oh, well, that didn't take very long. Have you ever seen like those people that do those like completion putting games and they finish yeah. it fast and they like panic? Yeah. Like the same idea. Like, you know, <laughs> you do like a like a, a, a putting make drill and you finish it. Like the one time in your life you finish it like first go and it's like total panic sets in. It's like I only put it for 10 minutes. 
Like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not getting any better. Instead of looking at it, the fact of like when when it took you two hours to do that drill before, if you'd have told yourself the next day you were come out and finish ten minutes, you're like sold. I'm done. I'm great. <laughs> I love yeah, it that. So it, it, it's it's the two different sides of it, and and kind of figuring it out, and mm-hmm. and you know a little bit of managing expectations, and and a little bit of understanding of just because I play golf on tour, like I'm not like not human. Like I mm-hmm. get frustrated. I get you know I you know there's things that I don't enjoy doing, but mm-hmm. the fact of you know the discipline and the attitude going forward of like if I'm going to go out there and play and compete with the best, I got to be willing to put the time and effort into to getting myself to that level and just sitting here going through the motions and just mindlessly, just apathetic, just to do it for the sake of doing it. It's not doing anybody any good, especially myself. Right. Well, no. And, and you know, what was interesting for me when I was at legends around the Vandy guys and, and like I said, Ben and Brant was how diligent they were with their time. Right. Especially Ben Crane. Like I was super impressed with him because it was like, I went over and said, Hey, do you mind if I watch this? Yeah. But in five minutes, I got to go do this. And then in 30 minutes, I got to go do that. And it was like very rigorous in what he was trying to schedule out and do. And like you were saying with the completion games is like, when you're done, you're done. Like, mm. and, and that's okay. You can go home, enjoy the victory. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and then it ain't going to be every day, but you know, enjoy that victory when you get it. And, you know, I think a lot of kids kind of willy nilly, if you will, their practices and they, you know, like, well, yeah, I hit balls for like three hours. Yeah. Isn't that good enough? And you're like, what, what did you do for those three hours when you hit balls? Because I was kind of watching a few hours of that, and uh, I saw you like goofing off with your buddy. You're happy Gilmore to couple, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I had a you know I I do a bunch of college golf, and um, one guy was you know kind of giving me like what well, you know I put the time in, I do this and I do this, and I said, man, when you're done with your college career, do you think they keep a record of how many hours that you practiced? Like, is that a record? Like, are we try is that the record we're trying to set? Because if we are, like, if that's the thing, like, you're going to win. Right. But I can tell you that guy that's winning all those tournaments and, you know, he's playing in tournament traveling and you're sitting here trying to hit the record range ball, you know, mm-hmm. count or whatever in the world you, in your mind you're doing. Like, there has to be a go-between and, and understanding of, like, more is not always better. I feel like half the time I end up talking college golfers out of practicing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and I think that's more of a personality. I love to chip and putt. I love to work wedges inside a hundred yards, but I hate hitting balls. That's a personality thing. And I'm not scared. I will have a grind session, man. I'm not scared to go dig it in the dirt, but for the most part, like I, I need to work on the things that I need to get better at. And that's right. all those areas. And, right. um, so you know, seeing that and I kind of use the golf course as the evaluation part of that. If I go out there and I feel like, all right, that's the thing I worked on, I'm going to go or use the golf course to evaluate. I don't really know what I'm going to practice on. I'm going to go out there and kind of see like, ah, it's kind of iffy or this felt pretty good. So, you know, I'm kind of balance it from there. But it it is funny the 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 time, man, if there's any kind of stereotype of college and junior golf, it's like the timekeeper. It's like, well, I had, you know, 27 hours you know these three days and this and that it's like what <laughs> like <laughs> like i told this one girl down in georgia uh the last few days is like you've hit more balls in this day than i've hit in the last two months and i have played a lot of tour events <laughs> like <laughs> uh and she's like really like she took that as a positive <laughs> I was oh, like, man. what are you doing like yeah. go play golf like and i asked her i said do you uh like what do you play she's like i don't even know where the first tee is i'm like (laughs) it's like you've just been here for like a week and you haven't seen the golf course she's like no i don't even i don't even know where the first tee is like okay and now i could probably be a little bit more like her and she could probably be a little bit more like me but just the fact of like you know some people get so ingrained to like just grind and grind and grind instead of go out there and actually enjoy the fruits of their labor like Mm. Totally. You know, once you got it, man, you got it. Go out there and try to figure it out. Like when, when there's only one ball in play and you know, what you write in the box at the end matters. Yep. What, um, you know, what in like in, in, in Scott Stallings world is like, what, what's next for you? Right. I mean, what are you striving towards? Obviously a great professional career and your next win. I get that. But like, you know, in, in 10 years from now, what is Scott Stallings trying to achieve? 
Uh, I mean, I'm never going to be the one to say that I want to play golf forever. Um, I love my job. I work my butt off to try to be the best I possibly can. But I'm not ignorant to the fact of like there is going to come a point when I'm going to do something else. And something in the junior golf development or you know college development, that kind of transition period, I don't want to – I would be a horrible college coach like absolutely horrible college coach. I would be a good college like assistant that I didn't have to travel and I didn't have to recruit. And then you got to play like, with I, the college I, players. And I, beat them I, up. I would be like a player development guy. Cause I could be honest with them, but I could validate it. Like, man, I did it. Like, mm. like you can't argue with the fact, like you can't fake it out there. Like you mm. either got it or you don't. But the idea of like to go sit in some 16 year old kid's house and be like, you're the greatest. It's like, no, you're not. Like I played with them, <laughs> like, like, and then and then whoever my head coach is, like that guy was number one in the junior in the country. How's he not going here? Is like he asked me who I, he's not the greatest. <laughs> like <laughs> I would be I horrible it. at that. But I feel like something in that area of the transition between high school to college or college to pro, and try to help be a go between to help people make good decisions and yeah. not just do what everyone else tells them to do, but like something that a guy that actually lived it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, experience validates a lot and, and understanding of, you know, I know what the junior side, I know the college side, I know the professional side. And again, I'm not an expert, but I have done it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I see that there's changes kind of throughout and everything. And so that's something I'm super passionate about and, and giving back to where I live and, and whether that's kids play free or, you know, some different junior events or other opportunities I have my wife and my family, that's something that's near and dear to us. And, you know, try to make the tour does a good job is trying to make every community that we go in better than we left it. And I've gotten a lot of opportunities here in East Tennessee to try to make it, uh, you know, better than it was when I got here and, and, you know, continue to try to, you know, support and be around people that are going to help us do that. Yeah. I, I had a pretty good hunch when I was going to ask that question that was going to be not playing related, that you, you had some other ambitions after the playing days are over. And, you know, it, your passion for junior golf is evident. And and as we bring the podcast coming around to a close, I, I just want like the people that are listening to know, like, I reached out to you on Instagram in a blind faith of hope that you just say yes and answer. And, and you didn't even bat an eye. It's like, when do you want to talk? And I was like, dude, this guy's awesome. Like, it, it, you, you, you struck a nerve with me because I knew that you were the real deal then. And you weren't just like, I'm just going to put these things out here, put my name on it just because it's, you know, a thing to do. But you're actually like in it and in it for the long haul and in it for the right reasons. And I, I can't express enough to the kids and parents that listen to this podcast with you is, you know, it, you want the best for everybody that comes in touch with you. And, and it's very impressive. And, and I'm so happy that you have started the kids play free. You have the Scotty, you're so involved with the Tennessee junior cup, you know, showing up, rooting those kids on in those matches. I could only imagine, you know, what those kids are like when Scott Stallings walks down the fairway and say, Hey, what's up guys. <laughs> you know, and, and so I just wanted to say thank you for, for being the part of junior golf that you are in Tennessee. And, and if you hadn't heard, by the way, the SNEDS tour, is like has doubled again in participation and signups for, for it. I'm getting calls from parents angry that they can't get their kid in events because we just keep blowing the lid off the roof with how many kids are playing the game in Tennessee. And I can only think that part of what you and, and the other, you know, and Brant and everybody else that's involved with, you know, unfortunately Darren, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, is growing, but you know, as, as we wrap it up, I always ask everybody to kind of give like one last parting note in, your advice has been so awesome this whole podcast, but if you had to like put one last stamp behind, you know, Scott Stallings name in Knoxville on a, on a big billboard, and it was like, this is his final thing that he said for left for the world. What would that be? You have two things you control every single day, your attitude and your effort. If that's the way that you carry yourself on in terms of how you make decisions, how you carry about, like ultimately you deal with adversity, you deal with positive, you deal with success, you deal with failure. If that's the way that you truly approach every and all situation, like how's my effort, how's my attitude towards this, you can truly accomplish anything and you can deal with anything that comes your way. And I, I'm not trying to be cliche. I know we've made some shirts and different things that have kind of said that, but that's, that culminates and is applicable to every aspect of life. And, you know, whether it's golf or life or, you know, whatever you're doing, that goes pretty way. And you're kind of 
what you said earlier, you may make one better decision and build off of that. And you know, don't make too much of a, a daunting challenge, you know, make something that's achievable and continue to make one step in the right direction and go from there. And I mean, it's amazing what the, the end result will look like. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Stalling, sir, thank you for sharing your day with me and, and talking for here for the last little bit. And, and I know everybody's going to love the insights you share with us today. And, and, you know, as we kind of talked about yesterday, we didn't want it to be, you know, too downer on some kids' hopes and dreams and, and all that stuff, but also have a lot of optimism too. And I think you're just a very real person, you know, and, and you're not going to, you know, fluff their feathers to make somebody feel good. You're going to give it to them like it is. And, and you did that today. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate you having me on and you'll continue to keep what you're doing in, in Tennessee and you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to do something together here in the future. And if anyone was watching this, I, I'm shocked that someone will not comment like, I can't believe he's in his car, uh, <laughs> but I'm not driving. My car is off. Uh, the, the house in the back of your window has stayed stationary the whole time, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, we tried to do it in a coffee shop. It was way too loud. Uh, ended up, you know, coming to the parking lot, just figuring it out out here. Uh, but I appreciate you having me on and, uh, you know, hope to see people out on tour, or, you know, somewhere in Tennessee playing golf somewhere. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, sir.